So what we're going to talk about this week are the Dutch views on the European Recovery Fund, or rather on the proposal Next Generation EU that have been put out by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, and the, the big question I think that everybody's asking uh, is, are the Dutch going to block a deal? When the European Council meets on the 19th, which is next Friday, um, the, the, the issue is how far the negotiations are going to be able to go, uh, go ahead. And, and, and in that context, are the Dutch uh, going to find themselves being the recalcitrants? Now, wh why, would, why would we expect that to happen? Well, the Dutch cabinet sent a letter to the Dutch parliament explaining what next generation EU meant in the context of the multiannual uh, financial framework. Uh, and basically, the letter that they've written reaffirms the position that they announced after the Franco-German proposal, which is a position that says uh, that they don't want the European Commission to be borrowing money in order to give grants. They would support loans, um, but, 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 but not grants. And they don't see any reason to have uh, grants. Uh, and, and, and equally, uh, they have a very strong preference uh, for structural reform, for changing institutions in a way that makes Europe's economies more resilient, and for conditionality attaching to any lending, uh, the responsibility for making those uh, necessary changes. Uh, and, and along the way, they're a little bit unsupportive of, of new taxes. They've got some, it's a nuanced position, they've got some uh, support that they would offer for environmental taxes that promote uh, or create incentives that would promote an environmentalist agenda, uh, and, and yet they're not very enthusiastic about a common consolidated uh, corporate tax base or, or uh, big taxes on, on, on big corporations. And, and so the question is really, if, if we don't have the taxes, can we afford the borrowing? And if we can't afford either, uh, unless the borrowing results in back-to-back -back lending, then, then do we have a real recovery fund? And by the way, how strongly... And for how long are the Dutch going to going to hold on to these positions? And the letter itself suggests that the negotiations next Friday are not going to be uh, not going to be uh, complete. That they're still going to drag on, and, and it's not quite clear uh, how long how long this is going to take. Well, I think this is a really interesting question. I think it's an interesting question not just on a current events level, uh, but but much deeper than that. I think it's an interesting question because it it challenges us to think about the role of large and small states in the European integration process. I mean, if this was Germany that issued that paper, we wouldn't have any question like this. We'd, we'd be much more, you know, yeah, what is Germany going to do? But we wouldn't be looking at it like, oh, wow, how long are they going to hold out dot, dot, dot type thing. So I think we need to think about the role of large and small states uh, in, in the European integration process. And along the way, I think we need to think about what is the nature of power in the context of uh, complex interdependence, and I'll go through this in some more detail as we work through the, the, the conversation, but, but is it about being able to go alone and do whatever you want, or is it about control over uncertainty? Is it possibly that you can break the rules in a way that people can't anticipate, and that gives you a sense of, uh, a sense of power above and beyond your means, right? Uh, because, because it's easy to imagine Germany going alone. It's a little bit harder to imagine the Netherlands going alone uh, going it alone, and we have to figure out uh, what that would mean. And, and then along the way, we have to think about the relationship between international relations and domestic politics, right? Or, or the second image in, in classic Waltian terms uh, in its reverse, uh, which is to say, you know, to what extent is this really a story about Dutch politics? To what extent is, is European integration influencing Dutch politics? And to what extent is Dutch politics influencing uh, the, that country's approach to European integration? Uh, and, and as we think about that, I think we should ask, you know, well, what does it mean for, for European integration or the European Union to be legitimate? I mean, if we railroad the Netherlands, if, the, if Germany and France steamroll the Dutch government and force them to, to go along with a deal there, uh, about which there's fundamental disagreement, is that really legitimate for them to do? And, and, and so we need to think about what this means about the political legitimacy of uh, of the European Union, particularly given its its democratic character, uh, and and most important of all, uh, this is the paper I should be writing right now, and and so by doing this as a presentation, I get to think through my thoughts and 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 kill two birds with uh, one stone, which is the image that I put up on the screen. Now, what I'd like to do uh, is to do this in, in, as a response to a series of questions. 
Uh, why is the Netherlands the country at the center of events? Uh, what are the Dutch really arguing? Uh, does it matter that the Netherlands is a small country? Uh, how much is this a result of political instability in the Netherlands and not smallness per se? And, and, and what other aspects about being small might be important, right? Uh, and, and, and I put in the screen uh, a, a remarkable picture of Joseph Luntz and, and Charles de Gaulle. Joseph Luntz was, uh, was the foreign minister of the Netherlands in the early 1960s. Uh, before he became Secretary General of NATO. Uh, and he, he must be one of the only people on earth at that time who was taller than Charles de Gaulle. And I thought that was a really interesting, uh, interesting image uh, because even though we think about the Dutch uh, as being a small country, uh, the fact of the matter is the Dutch foreign minister is a really big, uh, a, a really big and towering figure. Uh, and, and, and the story about Joseph Lentz and Charles de Gaulle is, is only one story among many. That picture was taken uh, around the time that the Dutch were the only country in opposition to de Gaulle's plan for reorganizing the whole of the European enterprise in a way <clears throat> that would have changed fundamentally the nature of the organization. And, 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 and the Dutch not only were the only country in opposition, but they won the argument, not least because the, the, the French uh, and, and de Gaulle himself decided to rewrite the whole proposal at the last minute. But, but I think it's important that this is not the first time the Dutch have been so outspoken. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's one of a long chain of events. And I just thought for two minutes and I came up with um, Pete Donkert in, in, in the autumn of 1991 when uh, Hans von der Broek, the Dutch foreign minister, was busy in former Yugoslavia. Pete Donkert, the European State Secretary, uh, or State Secretary for European Affairs, was the guy responsible for, for shepherding the Maastricht Treaty negotiations. And he tried to rewrite the whole draft of the treaty so that it wouldn't have the three pillar structure, so that it would all be uh, concentrated in, 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 in one kind of community. Uh, and John Major has this famous quote where he was speaking before the Houses of Commons and talking about how he just dismissed this idea out of hand. But the fact of the matter is, Dunkerts and the, and, and the Dutch negotiators at that time did take an iconoclastic position. They were different uh, from, from the rest. And, and that's not, not a limited example. I've also got Gerard Zalem and, and, and Hans Eichel. Hans Eichel is the German finance minister in the early 2000s up until about 2005. Gerard Zalem was the, the Dutch finance minister. Uh, and, and when the Germans and the French decided to suspend the rules for the excessive deficit procedure in November 2003, uh, Gerard Zalem was the only one who spoke out vocally against them. As a matter of fact, the Netherlands was the only country that joined the European Commission in taking the ECOFIN Council to court over its uh, procedural abuses, and they won at least in part. So, so again, you know, the Dutch stood alone, and in, 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 in that case, uh, managed to, to be heard. I've got a picture of Jeroen Dijsselbloem, who was the the Dutch finance minister and and head of the Eurogroup. Uh, he's the one who pushed really hard uh, for the banking <coughs> recovery and resolution directive to be the norm for this idea that you bail in creditors in the context of of, of the, the crisis in, in Cyprus. Uh, and he also had that, that very famous sort of offhand remark where he said, you know, well, why would we give money to someone if they've wasted all the money they had on, on women and alcohol? Uh, and, and he talks about this in a, in a memorable chapter in his uh, autobiography of the, the Euro crisis. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the, he was very isolated in that remark unsurprisingly, uh, and, and he cites Antonio Costa uh, as the Portuguese finance minister who, who lashes out at him uh, over that comment. Uh, I guess he gets a little bit of uh, uh, fraternal support from, uh, from Wopke Hoekstra, uh, who's the Christian Democrat finance minister in the current government, uh, and, and who made the, the comment about how we need to investigate <clears throat> why it is that these countries are so uh, unprepared, and that brought another uh, deluge of responses, uh, also by Antonio Costa, but, uh, but I put Giuseppe Conte's name because the Italian prime minister was very upset about that as well, uh, and, and lots of other people. So the Dutch have, have been alone in many circumstances, uh, and, and I think that's because the Dutch have a kind of a cultural outspokenness and appreciation for outspokenness, but, but I don't want to go off in my own 
uh, sort of cultural stereotyping. I, I just think it's important that we establish that this is not a unique situation, at least uh, at least historically. So, so what are the Dutch really trying to say? Well, I've given you a summary of their their sort of red lines, but I think it's important for us to to know. And there's an English version of the letter as well as a Dutch version. Uh, that that the turn in the letter, the tone in the letter, is firm, and and yet, so my Dutch friends tell me it's it's pretty moderate. They're not screaming out their objection to this. They're just saying, look, uh, we want we don't rule out a change of opinion, but. But these things just don't make a whole lot of sense. For example, the numbers don't add up. We needed the commission to explain to us why there needed to be an effort, and the commission comes up with one estimate of the money that's required and then another estimate uh, of the money they hope to raise, and the two numbers don't, don't, don't add together in the right sort of way. So why, why is that not the case, right? If we really need $1.7 trillion, why are they offering $750 billion? And, and, and what other things are out there, and, and what are the discounting? And... So there is a, a, a kind of a disconnectedness that I think the Dutch are right to point out. Uh, and and, and <laughs> then they have this kind of ironic thing. You see the European Commission uh, and, and the ESM had to validate that the, the debts of the existing member states were all sustainable because of the low interest rate environment in order for all existing euro area member states to be able to access the European stability mechanism for that special facility that was agreed on the 23rd of April. And so the Dutch quite reasonably asked, if their debts are sustainable, why can't they just borrow the money, right? Why do we have to give them grants, uh, given that you've validated their sustainability? Unless, of course, the sustainability analysis is off, in which case they shouldn't have access to the ESM without conditionality in any event. So, so I think there's, a, there, there's an interesting thing. There's, a, there's also this, you know, when you're giving out the money, the, the European Commission uses one key for describing how the money would be allocated, but that key doesn't correlate with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so why is it that this is supposed to be a response to COVID-19, but the, but the impact and the, and the allocations don't seem to correlate? That doesn't seem to make sense either. Um, and, and, and by the way, you know, where, where are all the other funds that were allocated, right? Like the money from the ESM. If they can access the ESM, then, then why do they need this money from the European Commission? If they're not going to access the ESM, why should the European Commission give them grants when we've already made concessional loans available? I think that's a, a kind of an interesting argument that I've probably over-elaborated given the text of the letter. But, but I think you see where it's going, and, and, and I don't think my extrapolation is, is too out of hand. Um, but I think, you know, most important, the Dutch, the Dutch quite rightly say, how can we agree to something when we don't know how much it's going to cost us, particularly in the out years uh, when, when the multi-annual financial framework is, has ended and we're still trying to figure out how to pay it off? Uh, oh, and, and by the way, what is the extra good that we're going to get out of this particular form uh, when we could have done it a different way, like the way that the Dutch had proposed with the Austrians, the Swedes, and the Danes? Uh, and, and doing it that different way, what is the extra value uh, that we're going to get? Is this is this really proportional, or or is there some other agenda that we need to to take into consideration? So I think I think what the Dutch are trying to say is that there are some legitimate, very important questions that need to be addressed before this uh, whole set of negotiations can end. And I've only listed a few of the many points they make. It's a, it's actually quite a strong quite a strong analysis. Um, and, and, and so, you know, should we listen to it? Uh, the Netherlands is just a small country. And I think, I think it has a lot to do with this notion about the, the, the notion of political power, right? So I teach this book by Lloyd Grubel, uh, Ruling the World, published in 2000, where <clears throat> Grubel talks about, uh, talks about uh, go it alone power. And he says, look, the, the reason the French and the Germans lead is because they can do it without caring whether other countries participate or not, and they go alone, and that changes the status quo, and that drags these other countries along with them, because the Netherlands, for example, would not want to be left out at the end of the day, because it has more to lose by being left out of any arrangement than it has to pay to participate, even though it has little design uh, or influence of the design features of whatever agreement there is. I think that's a legitimate point to make. And I think one could argue that that's why the, the Donkert draft of the Maastricht Treaty could be rejected and, and the Dutch still go along with the Maastricht Treaty in the first case. I think that's why the, the Zalem complaint about the treatment of the European excessive deficit procedure in, in 2003 uh, could be essentially ignored and the Dutch could go along with it 
Anyway, uh, but, but I think that the, there's another notion of power that comes from a slightly older reading of sociology by Michel Crozier from the early 1970s, where, where he says, look, you know, the, the, you know, size isn't all that matters. If you can control uncertainty, um, then, then you have a significant amount of power. And the fact that the Dutch could block theoretically, uh, any progress in the multi-annual financial framework negotiations. And they do underscore at the end of the letter that not only do these negotiations need to be agreed unanimously among the member states, but it will need to be ratified by the Dutch parliament. Uh, I, I think that's a different kind of power. And the Dutch are much stronger uh, in, in straight force to force uh, kind of power than you might anticipate in this context. Um, but, but I don't think this is really a question about being powerful. I think this is really a question about being small. Uh, and, and, and it's not a question about being small, where by small we mean weak, right? Because otherwise we would just be crab walking back into a conversation of power. I think it's a question of small in the way political economists have thought about what it means to be a small country. You see, and this is the paper that I'm writing, political economists have argued that what makes small countries unique, and not all small countries by any stretch of the imagination, uh, is, as David Cameron says, their ability to build these compensation mechanisms that allow them to adapt relatively flexibly and to cover the costs for those people who lose in the context of adaptation. So it makes it easier for them to change. Uh, and Peter Katchenside added on to that, that small countries have recognized that through their vulnerability, they have a virtue in, in achieving consensus. So they not only have these mechanisms for compensation, but they have mechanisms for enforcing agreement around the compensation and around what strategy should follow. Uh, and then the late Alberto Alessina uh, and, and, and the current Enrico Spoleore, um, I had this really interesting book, The Size of Nations, that said, you know, look, you know, when we talk about small, what we really mean is probably homogeneous, right? I mean, these are, these are homogeneous societies, and that's why they're consensual, and that's why they agree to build these compensation mechanisms. Uh, but, but the problem is that they, they, they can't achieve a complex division of labor with that homogeneity, uh, and so they need to engage in world markets, and so that sort of ties everything up in a neat bow. And, and at the end of that, you've got these small countries as like designed to follow along with what the large countries do because they know how to make the most uh, of any situation that's defined by some kind of hegemonic authority. I think that's a really compelling argument. These uh, articles that I've mentioned, articles, one article and two books that I've mentioned, have, have many, many hundreds, if not thousands of citations. Uh, and and I, I, I believe that this argument made a lot of sense at one point in time. But, but I also believe, and this is the argument that I made in my own book many years ago, um, that, that many of the countries that we describe as small are not small in that analytical sense anymore. And I think the Netherlands is not small in that analytical sense. I certainly don't think it's homogeneous. I don't think it's very consensual uh, in, in, in many issues. Uh, and I think their, their support for these compensation institutions is, is different from what it used to be. And I think it's worth paying attention to that difference. Uh, having said that, they may be too small in some crucial respects. And this is where I draw on a recent book uh, uh, called Good Governance Gone Bad by Darius Ornston, uh, which is a book really about the Scandinavian countries that looks at tightly knit societies and the way those societies are prone uh, to, to, to push back against uh, voices of opposition, right? So even though they might be outspoken domestically, there are limits uh, to how far you would go with that outspokenness. And we'll have to, to see if we can draw out Ornston's argument in the Dutch context in a meaningful way. Well, why do I think that the, the Dutch are not small, um, but rather that they're fragmented and conflictive? I think part of it is just that, that you can look at the structure of Dutch politics. There was a time when three political parties plus a couple of isolationist parties uh, dominated the whole political space and the Christian Democrats were in every government for a period of about 70 years, but that time ended in 1994 and, and now the Christian Democrats are a ghost of their former selves and the political space is, is, is much more fragmented. Uh, there's a wonderful article by Hal Bellicom 
and, and his colleagues uh, from 2018 in, in government and opposition uh, that, that describes the collapse or, or the evacuation of the political center uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, and, and, and talks about how unique that is, right? That there is no coherent, stable political center. And, and you can sort of see that in the current government, which is a four-party coalition that has a one-seat majority, but that has been polling well below that, that one-seat majority uh, in, <clears throat> for a, a long time since it, it, it managed to form uh, 220 days after, uh, after the 2017 election. So it was a difficult government to form, uh, and, and it's a difficult government to hold together, and, and it's got a very strong opposition, right? Everybody in the international community knows Kurt Wilders because he's got that and got that striking white hair and, and all that other stuff. Uh, but this guy, Thierry Baudet, uh, who, whose name I just grossly mispronounced, um, has, has coupled together this Forum for Democracy and it's a, you know, rocketed into being the second largest party in the 2019 elections to the Senate. Uh, and, and, and it plays a role on the right uh, right now that's, that's very important as a challenger uh, to the more conservative party of the Dutch prime minister, uh, uh, Mark Rutte. Um, having said that, my story is incomplete. And I had a, a, a really good exchange with a friend of mine, Adrian Schouts, uh, where we <coughs> talked about uh, whether the story that I had to tell made sense. And he was like, no, 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 this government is really popular. And, and indeed, if you go and look at the, 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 the polling numbers, which you find it is really popular. Now, at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand side, what you see are the seat allocations. It's relatively easy to translate uh, percentage numbers into seat allocations uh, because there are 150 seats in, in the Netherlands and only one electoral district, which is called the Netherlands. Uh, so, so you need two-thirds of a percent to get a seat in Parliament, right? Uh, and, and what you're looking at uh, are the, the four-party uh, coalition parties going ahead. And what you see uh, is that basically the, the three smaller parties in the government, the Christian Democrats, CDA, um, the, the sort of post-materialist liberal D66, uh, and, and the once isolationist, uh, now sort of more mainstream Christian Uni, um, they, they've basically been pulling flat throughout this crisis. But if you look at the liberal VVD, which is Mark Rutte's uh, party, uh, their, their estimated seat allocations has exploded, right? Uh, I, did a, I, I did a quick calculation, uh, and, and what I saw was that if, <clears throat> if uh, they had something like, well, I don't want to get the numbers wrong, I, 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 I think I threw it away, but, it, but they had something like 50-odd seats uh, combined going into March the 1st, and now they have a, a much larger number of seats, depending on which pollster you look at. Uh, um, you, could, you can see them going all the way up to, to something close to 80 seats. Uh, and, and, and that's an impressive increase. So you got to ask yourself, okay, well, where is all the support for Rutte's VVD coming from? Uh, I haven't been following Dutch politics for a long time, so I don't want to, I don't want to say anything really stupid, uh, but, but it seems to be, uh, coming from, from the support that he's able to scrape away slightly from cured builders and, 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 and from the Forum for Democracy, uh, but also from this really strange, 50 plus group, uh, which has collapsed actually from, from March, uh, it was, was polling over 6% six, 6 of the electorate uh, to, to now it's polling uh, down around 1%, right? Uh, or or, or something, something similar. I mean, it's a really small, uh, small number. So, the, so I think this is a, a really interesting thing. Who is this 50 plus party? Uh, this is a political party that supports issues for uh, older people, right? Uh, and and I, I took their their parliamentary faction leader and put her her picture on. Um, and 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 I think that there is some truth to the fragmentation story that I would tell. I mean, how many electorates have a party like this? They also have a, a party for animals and stuff like that. I mean, but remember, you only need two thirds of one percent to get into to the Dutch Parliament, so it's easy to fragment the electorate when you've got only one electoral district. Nevertheless, these guys, they, they, you know, they run a fairly serious organization. They got three or four um, members of parliament and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and they have a, a set of positions that you would expect to find in a population that's predominantly over 50, uh, that they're very conservative about law and order. They don't want your house to get broken into and the crime not to be solved. Um, they want to see more police 
on the streets. And they don't seem to like immigrants. I don't want to say they're anti-immigrant. They're, they're, they're very welcoming of asylum seekers, but, but they want them to wait 10 years in order to get, uh, to get access to citizenship, during which time they need to learn Dutch and they need to, to assimilate into society. And, and, you know, there are a whole bunch of things. And, and they want to take economic migrants and send them back home. This is not an un, uh, uncommon view, but I, I, I think it's, it, it puts them on a particular part of the political spectrum. Uh, they don't like deficits. They don't like debt. Uh, and they don't like unconventional monetary policy. Uh, so they've got this long thing about how you can't have a pension if you've got the ECB doing all this negative interest rate stuff. So, so I think we could put them on the right of, uh, of the political spectrum. And, and, and my sense is that this is a big part of the group that has shifted to support Mark Ritza because Mark Ritza is making all these things that are, um, you've got to follow the rules, you've got to have you know stable fiscal policy, you've got to push back against this crazy monetary policy to the extent to which you can. Uh, and, and I could imagine that being, could, could imagine that being attractive to their electorate. Um, having said that, this organization has not gone away uh, and, and, and they could easily uh, come back again, right? So to the extent to which they can contract, they can also expand. And, and I think that's going to be important for our story later on. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, what I want to say, though, is Mark Ritz's policy is popular, right? Uh, and, and indeed, in my sort of reading about the trust that there is in, in Ruta and the support for the VVD, in addition to the polling numbers, it's very hard to find any political party uh, outside of the coalition, uh, right? Because the Christian Uni and the, the, the D66 have argued for more European solidarity. But outside of that group, uh, inside the government, uh, it's very hard to find anybody that thinks that, that more European solidarity is called for, that Europe hasn't given uh, enough solidarity to, or the Netherlands hasn't given enough solidarity already, right? Um, and, and in that sense, <clears throat> I think, uh, and this is where I borrow from Ornston's argument, I think that, that the international community may be underestimating the kind of strength of conviction that the Dutch government has, right? I mean, you know, if, if everybody agrees with you, uh, then why would you change your policy, right? If the only people that are arguing that you should change your policy are the weakest parties in your own coalition, then, then that doesn't seem like a good move, right? Because any time you make concessions, um, the opposition parties are going to be waiting for you, right? This 50 plus, I'm sure, would be happy to make an argument that, that you shouldn't vote for the VVD. You should vote for them um, because the VVD can't be trusted uh, not to give away your money to the rest of Europe. Uh, everybody seems to support Europe, by the way, in the public opinion polling that I've looked at. Uh, and in, in much more important trust in Europe and satisfaction with European democracy in the Netherlands is on the rise, right? Not on the fall. So it's not like they're anti-European, but, but they are discomforted, uh, and this shows up very clearly in the public opinion polling, with the extent to which European influences are penetrating into Dutch life and making demands on, on, on Dutch resources. Uh, and, and so there's, there's nothing anti-European that I have been able to find, uh, in, particularly in comparison with polling in other countries. Uh, but, but there is something that's very guarded that everybody seems to agree on, uh, and, 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 and that would be uh, hard for them to compromise without being untrue to themselves in a way that I think would be very painful for this, uh, for this uh, support that, that, Rutte, uh, that Rutte has has garnered, right? And so I put this, this, um, this sympathy for, for the government thing. I mean, if you look at it, um, the, the hard core of VVD supporters is actually relatively small. Um, the first preference, so the only preference is the, the very small bit at the front. It's larger than for any other party, uh, but, but, but there's this sort of preference for them and then the sympathy for them that really gives them the growth Right. Uh, and, and for everybody else, that's that sympathy that gives them the growth potential as well. And, and, and that, I think, could shift. And so I don't see uh, any real interest in making European concessions because I, all I see is, is disadvantages that would be offset by what? Some kind of European praise. So so in that sense, going along doesn't seem like such a great doesn't seem like such a great deal. Uh, and, and, and this is where I really want to end this story, right? Uh, the Dutch position, to me at least, seems reasonable. 
Um, but it's a reasonable position about which I would argue reasonable people can disagree. And this is where I'm actually quite alarmed by this development because the problem is that we don't have a lot of time for reasonable disagreement. Uh, and, and, and yet, I don't think the Dutch are going to back down just because we think they're a small country because I don't think they are small. They have power resources that are considerable given Europe's constitutional arrangement uh, and, and they lack the kind of internal cohesion that would be necessary to impose discipline to get everybody to swallow something that they don't agree with. And, and there's huge agreement across the society um, that, that the position that the government is taking is the right position. So I don't think they're going to back down uh, quickly. And, and by the way, this has happened before. I think this is very similar to the situation in the early 1960s, and that's the part of the paper I've got to write uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and I don't believe that the situation is going to evolve any differently. I, you know, that situation evolved uh, into a fight that dragged into the middle of the 1960s and resulted in the Luxembourg Compromise, right? So, so the Dutch dug in their heel and heels and kept them dug in for years, right? Uh, in, in, in one of the more conflictive periods of European integration. And so it wouldn't surprise me if they did the same, not because they're anti-European, let me underscore, uh, but, but because they all believe that they're doing the right thing. And the problem is, is that the Italians are in a similar situation, right? That's a story for another day. Uh, but, but I think if we take this model for small countries becoming large, we can then apply it to large countries uh, and, and, and come up with a very similar kind of analysis. Uh, but, but the implication would be that we end up with Europe uh, hitting into a clash between a rock in a hard place, um, because I don't think the Dutch are going to back down, but I don't think the Italians are going to back down either. Uh, and, and if neither side backs down, this could drag out in a way that will, will only harden perceptions on either side of the conversation and could lead to real uh, real economic damage. Uh, I've put, I've put the, the Elsevier Bankvault uh, cover um, from about three weeks ago uh, up and then the, the Portuguese response. This is, a, a, I think, a, an interesting suggestion of the extent to which these, um, these images are juxtaposed, uh, each equally offensive to the other. Uh, and, and yet, in a certain way, you can understand the, the, the sort of reasonableness of the claims that they're making. And you've just got to hope they're going to be able to, to figure out how to move forward. Because ultimately, when reasonable people can disagree, that doesn't mean uh, they don't have to act. So thanks a lot. We'll see you next week.